That's why I love tracking so much. It's agnostic when it comes to diet. It's just the truth about what you're doing. It's like looking at your bank statements. There's no emotion there. It's just, this is what you spent your money on. This is how much money you put in the bank. There you go. So track your food for a week to give yourself an idea of how many calories you're eating. Welcome to the Legendary Life Podcast, where it's all about taking control of your health, losing fat, transforming your body, and living the life you deserve with celebrity fitness trainer and longevity enthusiast, Ted Rice. Every Friday, I drop some major knowledge bombs in my unstoppable After 40 newsletter. For example, in today's issue, I talk about my favorite exercise for sore shoulders. In fact, I give you a link to a video that I personally recorded showing how to do the exercise step by step. I talk about why some people seem resistant to weight loss. And I also share my top secret, if you will, for optimal workout results. So if that's something that you're interested in and you want to take this to the next level, our relationship to the next level, and you want to see some of the videos that I'm sharing and much more, go to legendarylifepodcast.com slash newsletter. That's legendarylifepodcast.com slash newsletter and subscribe now. Have you ever wondered why fat loss is so difficult? Well, I'm here to tell you. It's because you're making mistakes. You're just not doing it right. It's not your metabolism. It's not your age. It's none of those excuses that you've been using. You're simply not doing the right strategies. And today we're going to dive into the five biggest fat loss mistakes that I see people making. Now, I've been in this business for 23 years and I've heard a lot of excuses over the past years I've been in the business, past couple of decades. And these five mistakes are the ones that are the most common that I see people make when they hop on a call with me or when they reach out to me on social media. So if you want your fat loss journey to be easier, you're going to want to listen to this episode. What's up, my friend? Welcome back to the show. And if you're new, welcome. I'm your host, Ted Rice, coach to executives and entrepreneurs. So let's dive right in. Mistake number one, focusing on eating healthy food. What are you talking about, Ted? That doesn't make any sense at all. Well, I'm here to tell you it does make complete sense. So stick with me. One of the biggest epiphanies that I had on my personal fat loss journey was this. You can get fat from eating healthy food. Why? Because all food has calories in it. All food has calories in it. And in the past, I was 100% sure that if I could just eat super clean, if I could just eat whole foods, like a paleo-ish diet, that it would be impossible to gain fat, except I got fat. And this is the biggest mistake I see people making. They feel like they can just eat cleaner. If they could just eat cleaner, right? That's what we call it, eating clean. That fat loss would be just so easy that it's really not a big deal that you're eating a 16-ounce ribeye steak because it's grass-fed and finished. So it's okay. And hey, the fats are healthy and you can't get fat from eating healthy fats, right? I mean, that's just insane. I used to believe that you're probably there right now or maybe on the same line of thought. And I'm here to tell you, nothing could be further from the truth, especially if you want to get down to very lean levels. And we're talking under 15% for a man and under 20% for a woman. The calories of everything that you eat, except maybe fibrous vegetables, matter. So if you're having a large potato versus a small potato, if you're having a 16 inch, a 16 inch, 16 ounce ribeye steak versus an eight ounce or a six ounce steak, you have to get this through your head because if you don't, you're going to be squandering your efforts because you're going to, you can be eating very healthy and putting a lot of olive oil on all your salads. I know people like this. This might be you. You're pouring that olive oil on. You're like, no, there's nothing wrong with this. In fact, the more olive oil I eat, the healthier I get because I read some stupid blog post. And, and again, the blog post was stupid. I used to be there. I used to even kind of take shots of olive oil every once in a while or eat 
spoon feed myself coconut oil because I'm like, no, this is healthy fats. Hopefully I don't get you know any problems from doing that later down the road. But let's talk about what to do instead. Even if you're eating clean, I want you to track your food for a week to give yourself an idea of how many calories are in the foods that you're eating, not anyone else is eating or the foods that you think you should eat, just the foods that you're eating. That's why I love tracking so much. It's agnostic when it comes to diet. It's just the truth about what you're doing. It's like looking at your bank statements. There's no emotion there. It's just, this is what you spent your money on. This is how much money you put in the bank. There you go. So track your food for a week to give yourself an idea of how many calories you're eating. Number two, changing up your workout routine. In fact, I was going to do a post on it earlier for a a future Real Talk Friday, and I just wanted to see what people were saying out there about changing up your workout routine, just to get an idea of, I know what I think, but I like to see the presentation. And what I found just was shocking. I Googled, why should I switch up my workout? And over 200 million results, not 200, not 200,000, 200 million results came up. And of course, I only looked at the first page and it was terrible advice. Terrible. A couple of the things that they mentioned were like, well, you want to change up your workout routines because uh, you can get repetitive stress injuries. Okay. And the other thing that they said that was good, a couple articles on the first page said, it can help you if you're getting bored, if your workouts, okay, okay, I can see that. Now, here's the truth. The key to results is sticking with your routine long enough to perform more reps on an exercise with the same weight and to eventually add weight. In other words, it has nothing to do with muscle confusion, has nothing to do with changing up your routine to shock your muscles or getting better results. That's all total bullshit. And I mean total, I don't mean 93% or 80-20%. I mean 100%, I was going to say per shit, because that's kind of what it is. It's 100% bullshit, folks. Why? Because I said so? Because I'm like, I figured it out? No, it's it, people have done research studies on this. And some of the best results I ever got, if you look at my, uh, my thumbnail is when I got, the thumbnail for this podcast is when I got in shape in Bangkok. I was basically doing the same routine for a few months, but part of that routine was doing Muay Thai boxing in Thailand. But when I really transformed my body in 2020, when I was locked in a room in quarantine in Colombia, I was doing the same exercises for over four months. Same exercises, four months. What was I doing that was different? Wasn't trying to confuse my muscles. It was trying to add more reps. Every time I did the workout, I tried to do more reps, just one more rep than what I did last time. Now, of course, using good technique, I should say the form is super important. If you're looking like, you know, a newborn gazelle while you're trying, who's trying to walk when you're performing your exercises, you need to check your technique. That's not what we're talking about here, but we're talking about with good technique, trying to squeeze out another rep. And once you do that for a couple of weeks, try to squeeze out another rep, try to squeeze out another rep, try to squeeze out another rep do that for maybe two to three to four weeks, then that's when you add some weight. And then you hit whatever reps you get for that weight. And then the next workout, you try to squeeze out one more rep. You try to squeeze out another rep on the next workout and so on. Then you add a little bit more weight. And that is how you transform your body. And if you're making the mistake of changing things up because you need to shock your muscle because you're not getting sore anymore, guess what? They've done studies on this. There's no correlation between soreness and results. In fact, what they found is either no correlation at all or an inverse correlation. In other words, it makes you perform worse because you've damaged your muscle so much you feel sore. Now you feel maybe a little pumped after that, but guess what? That pump, that's not muscle growth. That is inflammation of your muscles. Muscle growth is actually laying down new muscle fibers. And it doesn't happen just because you got sore after one workout. The soreness goes away. I'm never sore. 
in my upper body. I got a little sore the other day from my lower body, but I'm never sore with my upper body. Never sore. And I hate being sore because I feel like if I'm sore, that's going to stop me from making progress. It's going to take too long. I want to train in a couple of days. So here's what to do differently. Write down your workout, write down the reps and weight on your workout, on every workout for the next three months and make sure you're adding a rep here or there. It's not always going to happen. I don't always add, uh, I'm not always able to add reps, but I had a bad night of sleep or I'm a bit stressed. But in general, the reps that you're able to do with the same weight should trend upward. It may look like the stock market going up. Hopefully it doesn't look like the crypto, but it should like look a little bit like a Apple stock or whatever, Tesla, whatever. It should trend upward. Same thing with the weight you're using. It should trend upward. Now, what we have, and this is what I do personally too, I use the same app that I give my clients. I track my workouts. My clients track their workouts. So where I can look in detail and see like, oh, that's what that's the number of reps they did with that weight. Is there a trend up? Yes or no? That's what I want you to do differently. The next big mistake is using the scale to measure progress. One of the most common issues that come up with my coaching clients is the dreaded number on the scale. Clients have told me in the past that they feel good when they wake up in the morning. They feel like they've been working hard, eating the right things, tracking their macros, hitting their workouts adding the reps, just like what we talked about, tracking everything. And then they step on the scale and the number doesn't match their expectations. Sometimes it might be they've lost weight, but thought it should have been more based on all the hard work they've been doing. Sometimes it'll be up and shift their mood negative and they'll get a case of the fuck it's. Other times it won't move at all and they'll be frustrated because they've been putting in so much work and feel like, ah, this just isn't working. And as a result, I've gone back and forth as a coach about how often I ask my clients to weigh themselves because if they're unable to handle the number that pops up on the scale, it can create a domino effect where they start self-sabotaging. For example, you step on the scale, you see the number, you feel bad. Then you think, ah, this is stupid. I should stop doing this. I'm so sick of this. I've been working so hard and the scale isn't telling me what I need to know. And guess what? You skip your workout that day. Do you see how the feelings cause the thoughts, cause the change in behavior? And then how are they going to feel when they skip the workout worse? And what's that going to make them think about more negative? Then how is that going to affect their behavior? I think you get the point. You see the downward uh, spiral starting. Now, personally though, I don't weigh in every day, but I weigh in frequently. Frequently, I, uh, even after bad days, like quote unquote bad days. In fact, I spent a day at the at Universal Studios again, riding roller coasters. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite as fun. I've been like, that was my third time in the past few weeks. It wasn't quite as fun, but it was still a good time. Got me away from work. You know, I'm we're working hard here. And but one thing that happened at the parks is I, I tried a brookie for the first time. You ever hear about those? It's a brownie and a cookie combination. It's a brownie with a cookie in it, chocolate chip cookie. Not the most amazing thing I've had, but I had to try one, a brookie. How American is that, by the way? And then I ate also edible chocolate chip cookie dough. There's a place called Fire Eaters Grill in Universal Studios that has this delicious edible cookie dough. For dessert. Everything else there is horrible, by the way. The gyro, the it's in that Mediterranean section, but that edible cookie dough, something special, let me tell you, if you're into that type of thing. And I also had a cookie, like a big white chocolate cookie, white chocolate chip cookie. And the next day I knew it was gonna be, I knew the scale was gonna be up. So I stepped on it, it was up a couple pounds. I didn't take it personally. I just said, yeah, that, you know, it's not as, let's go. Okay. Just now I'm, I'm, I do that myself because I'm there. So what should you do? What to do instead? Well, here's what we tell our clients to do. Use the scale weekly or maybe even not at all. I gave you an example of some of my clients, what they struggle with. I, and I shared what I personally do, but what I want you to figure out here is what works for you. So use the scale or if it messes with you too much, it's one, it's a sign that you've got some internal work to do. So maybe you don't want to use it at all at first. What I personally love and what I get my clients to do is to use a DEXA scan monthly. 
Why? Because I, I feel if you've got a lot of, if you struggle emotionally with the weight thing, use a DEXA scan because it quantifies not just the change in weight, but it quantifies the fat that you've lost and the muscle that you've gained. You can also use the scale and a pair of jeans that are hard to fit into. We use a combination of all of the above in my coaching program. The data from different sources, but most importantly, the DEXA scan, are what helps my clients to break their preconceived notions about what the number on the scale actually means. I've got so many stories about this, including I've had a client, a female client who gained weight in my coaching program, in my group coaching program, when we first started it back in 2020. And we've just opened it up. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. And she gained weight in my program and she started freaking out. And in the group program, I don't hop on a call, one-on-one call with them unless it's an emergency. And I said, listen, I'll hop on a call with you, but I don't want to just talk about your emotions. So the way you feel is important to me, but I want some data. And so she went and got her body fat tested. And you know what? Her weight went up, but her body fat went from 22% to 18%. Do you understand? Weight went up, but body fat went from 22% to 18%. What happened? Well, she gained a shit ton of muscle is what happened. Scale on the weight goes up when that happens. That's how it works. You gain, you build muscle, it changes the weight. It's how it works. That's why you pay for meat by the pound. Anyway, (laughs) I don't know if that last part was helpful. But then we didn't need to talk. She was like, oh, I feel good. But because she wasn't, I want you to think about this. She was not able to, because of her emotional issues with the scale, she wasn't able to see the fact that she had dropped body fat, was much leaner, had more muscle. But because she had a story in her head and was focused on that story, she wasn't able to see the truth. And the truth is, She had gained muscle, a lot of it, because I put her on, I've got some special techniques for clients who are just like, hey, she was a total rock star, total high performer. And she was just like, tell me what to do. I want the best results ever. I gave it to her and she got awesome results in terms of muscle growth, but totally freaked out about the scale. Couldn't see that it was 100% muscle and that she had actually lost fat because of that narrative going on in her head. So what to do instead, use the combination that works for you and be mindful if you're measuring yourself in a way and it's triggering you and causing that negative spiral of thoughts, behaviors, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. You want to stay away from that negative spiral. Okay. Anything that triggers you, you've got to, you've got to use a different approach. All right. The next thing we're going to talk about is overestimating how many calories you burn with exercise. Have you ever completed a workout, say a hard cardio session, which hopefully you're not not doing this, but, and you saw the calorie estimation patted yourself on the back? This is a problem. In fact, there's whole business models like Barry's Bootcamp or Orange Theory. I'm not sure Barry's Bootcamp actually does this. I think Orange Theory is the one they strap a heart rate monitor and they try to quantify the number of calories that you burn in a workout. But here's the thing. The only way to really measure the calories burned during exercise is to put a a breathing apparatus on because the way you measure calories, calorie burn is through oxygen uptake. You can't, your Apple watch isn't doing that. Your heart rate monitor is not doing that. Those are estimates based on your weight and based on your heart rate, which is really inaccurate, woefully inaccurate. It's like better not to even pay attention to it at all. Inaccurate, stupidly inaccurate. So here's the only thing that you need to know. It's always going to be easier to cut out 500 calories from your diet than to burn 500 calories with exercise. So what to do instead? Stop focusing on the calorie burn with exercise. It doesn't matter. Instead, focus on what we talked about before, building muscle in the gym, focus on that strength training, doing more reps and adding weight over time. And if you want a bonus, then Work on your steps and hit a step goal. Uh, set a step goal and hit it. You know, seven thousand is a good start. Ten thousand, if you want to be a rock star, and if you want to be a superhuman, then you know, fourteen thousand, twelve to fourteen thousand a day. So there you go. Now the fifth mistake I see people make is cutting too many calories. So when I first figured out that calories were the key to fat loss, I had a great idea. 
Listen to this idea. Listen to how game-changing this idea is. If it's all about calories, I'm just going to cut my calories super low. So smart. God, I'm a genius. Except that when I went on this particular diet, and this was the Ducon diet uh, I wanted to try, you eat protein and nothing else. Did it work? Yes. Did I start having electrolyte imbalance issues? Hyponatremia, in other words, dizziness, and eventually did it lead to panic attacks? Well, also yes. Did it also lead to a stagnation in my weight eventually? Also yes. Now look, you may not be as ridiculous as I am and uh, you know push a couple months into an extreme diet like that, but what I see most people suffering from, I was just sharing that story to let you know I've made these silly mistakes myself, and that's how I learned. You'll probably get hungry at very least and suffer with brain fog. So it's not ideal if you're an entrepreneur or an executive running a company, you're, you're like in the meeting and people are expecting you to put out a dumpster fire in the business and you're just like, what, what are we talking about? My brain needs glucose and doesn't have it. You don't want that. Now, look, sometimes I'll use a low calorie plan for rapid fat loss. In fact, with my new clients, I give them, I give them a rapid fat loss plan where they drop in between four to six pounds in the first 10 days. And I also use it for myself every once in a while to balance out overeating. But if I'm honest, I don't do it that strictly. For example, when I was eating the Brookie and the edible chocolate chip cookie dough, all I did was I used one of those meals that I would use in rapid fat loss. I ate one for dinner, kept my calories super low for the rest of the day. And the next day, I I kept my calories a little bit lower. That's an advanced strategy called calorie cycling that I teach my clients. But what I do instead now is I just use those meals to, um, to when I'm going to go out to eat, or like I just said, I use them to balance the calories. Okay. So what do you do? What should you do instead? Well, find the number of calories that gives you steady progress, say about a pound a week of weight loss. It makes you feel good at the same time. And by the way, just a quick bonus tip there. When I say a pound of weight loss per week, I mean an average of one pound a week. What that means is, let's say you lost two pounds in the first week and nothing in the second, you're still averaging one pound per week. Are we with each other? So good. Find the number of calories that gives you steady progress, about one pound, an average of one pound per week, and makes you feel satiated at the same time. That's what you want. All right. That is it for today. Let me just do a brief recap for you. Number one mistake, focusing on healthy food when what you should do is track your calories for a week because healthy food also has calories. Mistake number two, changing up your workout routine because you want to confuse your muscles, but you're the only one confused about what to do. So do this instead. Write down your workout, write the reps, write the weight, track your workouts for the next three months. Don't change it. Make sure you're making progress. And I promise you, your body is going to change and you're going to be so happy you listen to me, even though sometimes the way I say things might be a little bit obnoxious. Number three, using the scale to measure progress. I personally use this scale and I know how to use it, but if you're having trouble with it because of the emotions it triggers in you, maybe use the scale once a week, maybe not at all. Maybe use a DEXA scan, maybe use a pair of jeans, find the right approach that works for you. DEXA is the best because it's really going to help you quantify the data in a way that you've never had before. All my clients are amazed when they get their DEXA scan. So I would just say, just do that instead. And number four is overestimating how many calories you burn without, uh, with exercise. So stop focusing on the calorie burn with exercise. What to do instead is go back to focusing on what I said in number two, adding more reps with the same weight or adding more weight over time. That's what's going to change your body. And number five is cutting too many calories. Forget about the cabbage soup diet. Forget about the master's cleanse. Forget about all those things. Instead, find the number of calories that gives you steady progress. An average of one pound per week is good and makes you feel good at the same time, makes you feel satiated at the same time, makes you feel like you can stick with it. That's what I want to leave you with. Love you a lot. Have an amazing weekend and speak to you on Monday. One of the biggest requests that I've received over the years of doing this podcast is, hey, Ted, hearing from experts and yourself, it's great. 
but I want to hear from someone like me, someone who isn't a health expert, who achieved great health results, great results with body transformation, but they weren't an expert. So I'm going to be interviewing one of my clients on Monday. Her name is Aoife. She's an executive coach and healthcare consultant, and she had incredible results in my program. But she also had some challenges. And so if you're a person, if you're a high performing executive, entrepreneur or professional, and you're wondering, well, do other people have the same challenges as I do with getting in shape and knowing what to eat and fitting in that workout in terms of building a family and all the work I have to do and the vacations and other things? Well, you're going to want to listen to Aoife's story and her journey of how she transformed her body and made it into a lifestyle that she feels like she can keep up for the rest of her life. So if that sounds interesting to you, make sure you tune in on Monday. Have a great one and speak to you then. Every Friday, I drop some major knowledge bombs in my Unstoppable After 40 newsletter. For example, in today's issue, I talk about my favorite exercise for sore shoulders. In fact, I give you a link to a video that I personally recorded showing how to do the exercise step by step. I talk about why some people seem resistant to weight loss. And I also share my top secret, if you will, for optimal workout results. So if that's something that you're interested in and you want to take this to the next level, our relationship to the next level, and you want to see some of the videos that I'm sharing and much more, go to legendarylifepodcast.com slash newsletter. That's legendarylifepodcast.com slash newsletter and subscribe now.